After three years of being Julia's simp, I decided to stop, I deleted her, moved out of the apartment, and came up with a random excuse to break up with her. Our couple's necklace fell into the artificial lake. The fortune teller said that's a bad omen. I never expected to see her again, and I didn't think she'd believe my ridiculous reason for breaking up. Later, I heard the stories. The top student in a university's literature department, known for her beauty, went mad one night and jumped into the lake, all for a necklace that had disappeared. Chapter 1. Class ended. I picked up my tablet, opened my phone, closed my eyes, and prayed for three seconds. When I opened my eyes again, nothing had changed. Julia still hadn't replied to my messages. Julia, I'm heading out. Don't forget to take your keys. Julia, when do you finish class? I'll pick you up. Julia, there's a huge new game store near campus, and they've got the game you've been waiting for. Wanna check it out after class? Our conversation was a one-way street, filled only with my messages. I kept telling myself she was just too busy to check her phone. But during the psychology class, the professor mentioned that if someone is important enough to you, you'd run out of the shower mid-shampoo to respond. Chapter 2. I waited for Julia outside the literature department. Once, I went straight to her class to find her, and she got mad. So now I wait at the gate. Finally, as the sun set, I saw her, tall and slender. She stood out in the crowd. Her short skirt caught the last rays of the setting sun creating a graceful arc. A guy was walking beside her, holding papers and calculating something with her. Julia always had guys around her. Chapter 3. Julia. I walked up to the two of them, hands in my pockets, staring at the guy. He looked awkward under my gaze but held his ground and stared back. Julia's eyes met mine, and after a moment, she spoke indifferently. What do you want? In that instant, I had a million questions. Why didn't you reply to my messages? Why are you so close with other guys? Why did you forget our plans again? But when I opened my mouth, the only words that came out were, The sun is setting. Julia, are you cold? Chapter 4 The evening breeze carried a hint of chill as I stared at her indifferent, beautiful face. I couldn't help but remember how my friends reacted when they found out I'd become a simp for her. You're not exactly lacking, men. Why cling to one tree? When they realized it was Julia I was simping for, they understood. That's Julia. After all, she's a goddess. If you stop simping, There'll be plenty of guys who'll take your place. There's always that one person who leaves an indelible mark on your heart when you're young. For me, that person was Julia. During a high school sports event, she suddenly leaned against me. Sweat trickled down her temple, and I saw a beauty in her face that I had never noticed before. She stared at me directly, tilting her head slightly, like a vibrant bubble full of colors, dazzling and captivating. Hey, can I buy a bottle of water from you? Back then, Julia probably never imagined. She was getting herself involved with a troublemaker like me. Chapter 5. In the end, Julia still went with me to the game store I'd messaged her about that morning. I didn't expect it to be so crowded for a newly opened store. Julia didn't like crowded places. So, when we saw the long line at the entrance, even before she could frown, I was already pulling her away. Forget it. Too many people. But she stopped. I want dragon and warrior. Help me wait in line. I'll wait outside. Sometimes, she'd be in a good mood with a little more patience than usual. I stood in line at the game store, glancing outside. There she was, in her white dress, with her bag slung over one shoulder, scrolling through her phone. Just standing there drew the attention of plenty of guys. But by the time I finally got the game discs and walked out of the store, she was already gone. Chapter 6. I sent her a WeChat message and called her. She didn't reply or answer. I wasn't even surprised. I had grown used to her coldness and distance. The last time she acknowledged me was after my 21st attempt at pursuing her. The teacher praised my persistence, saying that guys like me were rare these days. My mom, on the other hand, just called it stubbornness. That same persistence was evident in my pursuit of Julia. She was guaranteed admission to a university in our second year of high school, while I was just an average student, far from reaching a university standards. The first time I brought her breakfast in high school, she coldly remarked, I don't like people with bad grades, because of that one sentence. I jumped from ranking 361st to 57th in our grade. Eventually, I managed to get into a university through an adjustment program. When I ran into her at the university gate, I casually greeted her for the 16th time. That time, she didn't say much. She just frowned slightly and said, I don't like you. Chapter 7. Even now, after two years of being in a relationship, I doubt Julia likes me all that much. I went home alone, holding the game discs. I didn't turn on the lights. I just sat on the floor in the hallway covering my eyes with my hand. After a while, I realized my hand was wet. Don't be sad because she abandoned you. It's not like this hasn't happened before. Don't be upset. If you feel like this every time, life is going to be miserable. Damn it. Am I even a man?
Crying over something like this, I kept trying to convince myself, over and over, until my phone rang, but when I saw her name on the caller ID, my heart skipped a beat, I answered, but it wasn't her voice on the other end. Is this senior? Uh, I saw Julia at the game store earlier. We had a department dinner tonight, so I invited her to join. She seems a bit drunk. Can you come pick her up? It was the same junior who had been walking with Julia earlier today. I agreed, stood up, and made sure to grab her thick coat on the way out. As I cursed myself for still simping, I thought, if I keep this up, I might as well be the pale joker card from a deck. Chapter 8 Julia was definitely drunk. When I brought her into the apartment, she still hadn't let go of my hand. We're home, Julia. I started unwrapping her scarf. Her face was flushed, and so were her ears. Her eyes were slightly misty, staring directly at me. After a moment, she stood on her toes, trying to kiss me, but her balance was off, and we both fell to the floor. In the slightly messy hallway, she propped herself up on my chest, and her kisses trailed down from my ear, tasting faintly of alcohol, like green grapes. Julia, do you remember what you promised me yesterday? I gently pushed her away and adjusted her collar. She frowned slightly, likely not remembering. If she didn't remember, fine. Even if I blamed her, she wouldn't care. So I stumbled to my feet and took the cake out of the fridge to show her. You said yesterday that you'd spend tonight with me for my birthday, but you ended up going to dinner with that junior. Why? Why can't you care about me? Even just a little. This question had been circling in my throat a million times, but I couldn't get it out. She lowered her gaze to the cake, then unwrapped it and set it on the table. Let's celebrate now. It's not the same. What's different? It's past midnight. So what? She stared at me, her impatience already showing in her brows. Nothing. I sighed, walked over, cut the cake, and gave her a piece. The sweet, creamy frosting melted in my mouth. I didn't dare tell her how much I had looked forward to this birthday. Like an idiot, I thought she'd spend the night with me, celebrating. But even if I told her all this, she wouldn't understand. I raised my hand and clinked my cake against hers. Julia, do you think I'll always love you? She didn't answer that question, and I don't know the answer either. At least not yet. Julia is like a jar of honey, constantly tempting me. I'm not willing to give up, thinking that someday she'll look at me with eyes full of love, or maybe one day, I'll stop liking honey, and I'll pack up and leave her, by then, no matter how much she calls out for me, I won't look back. Chapter 9 When I woke up, there was a necklace next to me, it was heart-shaped, and it looked like there should be another one to match. After a while, I realized this was probably a birthday gift, so, does Julia care about me or not? Most likely not. If I truly left her, she wouldn't be too upset. She'd probably feel relieved. Many times, I'm grateful that I chose psychology as my major. Otherwise, Julia would have driven me to complete emotional exhaustion. If that were the case, I wouldn't be able to sit next to her in public class the next day, pretending nothing was wrong. You're up early. Did you eat? I propped my head on my hand, watching her like everything was fine. I did. Her answer was curt. The early morning light brushed her face, and I zoned out for a moment. Wondering why I was still so hopelessly attracted to her because of that face. I was a little surprised. Julia didn't usually eat breakfast, which had messed up her stomach over the years. Most of the time, I had to force her to eat breakfast. Senior, I brought breakfast for her. Suddenly, a head popped up on Julia's other side. I raised my eyebrow. It was that junior from yesterday. His tone was cheerful, but there was a hint of showing off, as if he wanted to flaunt some special connection with Julia. But I knew Julia wouldn't be involved with him. Based on what I knew about her, if she truly liked someone, she'd have dumped me and broken up directly. In Julia's eyes, the only thing she ever really cared about was that ancient literature collection I would never understand. The only reason she even got together with me was because of literature. That was the 21st time I'd said something meaningless to her. I would, like usual, bother her occasionally, never expecting much in return. What are you doing? And then, that afternoon, I remember it clearly. There were 4 minutes and 27 seconds left before class ended. She responded, I like you. God knows the impact those 5 words had. In that moment, I prepared for every possible scenario. Maybe she lost a dare. Maybe her account got hacked. Or maybe she meant to say, I don't like you, and typed it wrong. 5 minutes later, she sent another message. Do you want to be with me? I felt like I had exploded into fireworks. Later, I found out. Two guys in the department had fought over her. Ending up in the hospital and her advisor had approached her. She was annoyed, so she pushed me forward, saying she had a boyfriend. Chapter 10. This public class was an elective, open to students from all grades, so it was a mixed group. After the lesson, the professor assigned a project that required partners to conduct research. Naturally, I assumed I'd partner with Julia, considering I'm her boyfriend.
but that junior from yesterday quickly wrote his name alongside Julia's. This is the thing, senior, he said. We're both in the same major, and we've got a project assigned by our professor. This research topic aligns well with that, so it's more convenient for me and her to work together. You, maybe you could find someone else. This time, I could hear the smugness in his voice. I looked at Julia. She didn't react, just stared at me. Her lips pressed together. It was obvious she agreed with him. I was at a loss for words. This elective was a literature class. I had only signed up because Julia was in it. Most of the students here were from the humanities. And I, being from the science department, barely knew anyone. I watched as everyone found their partners, while I was gradually left out, and I instinctively glanced at Julia for help. But I forgot one thing, why would she ever side with me? She was probably tired of me and teamed up with the junior on purpose. I scratched my nose, feeling awkward. I cursed myself silently for being so useless. It was such a small matter. Yet I still felt embarrassed. Look at you. Acting like you're someone important again. Senior. What's wrong? Didn't find a partner. Of course. That junior had to pour salt in the wound at that moment. I clenched my fist. Ready to finally snap and give him a piece of my mind. But just then. A clear voice came from above. He does have one. Someone tugged at my sleeve. Joseph. What a coincidence. You're taking the classical literature elective too. It really was a coincidence. My classmate Daniela. She was the president of the ballet club, and reading dry, complex poetry was exactly the kind of thing a wealthy young lady like her would be into. Looks like I'd been saved. I took the list and started to write her name, but I couldn't find a pen, so I turned to the person beside me and asked, Can I borrow a pen? That's when I noticed something. My girlfriend, who hadn't said a word this whole time, her gaze was fixed on the hand Daniela was using to hold my sleeve. After a moment, she handed me a pen. For a brief second. I actually thought she was jealous. Chapter 11. Class was almost over after the group assignments were made. A girl behind me tapped my back and asked if I wanted to grab lunch together. Ah, uh, I was going to go with Ju. I was about to say I was going with Julia, but then I saw her already grabbing her stuff and walking out. She was wearing a flowing white dress, her tall figure disappearing without even a glance back. It didn't seem like she had any intention of having lunch with me. Are you guys having a cold war or something? In the bustling cafeteria, Daniela barely lifted her head from her meal. Julia and I rarely had cold wars because I almost never ignored her. I knew that if I didn't talk to her, she might never speak to me again. I had no shame and a great attitude, I could bounce back from anything. It's nothing. I'll go find her this afternoon. I raised my spoon, changing the subject. So, did you choose the classical poetry course because you're interested? I chose it because of you. The words Daniela said nearly made me choke on my tomato and egg soup. She put down her chopsticks. Looking at me seriously, Joseph, are you seriously not considering going to the UK to study with Professor Fu? There are so many students in the class, and Professor Fu specifically chose you. It's a great opportunity to secure a place for graduate studies. Our criminology professor had always valued me. She had invited me more than once to study with her in the UK. On one hand, she was a top expert in the field, and being her student would guarantee a bright future. But on the other hand, I had never left the country, and agreeing to this would mean I'd have to go far away. It would also mean seeing Julia, much less often. Pathetically, I felt that not being able to see Julia was a hurdle I wasn't ready to cross. So I had been stuck, unable to decide. I knew that, with how lovesick I was, people online would roast me endlessly if they knew. And to think I'm a psychology major, then I'll have to endure twice as much scolding. Daniela, I'm really not thinking straight, I sighed, stirring the vegetables on my plate. I'm studying psychology, but my love life is a complete mess. Daniela gave a dramatic exaggerated sigh. What does it matter? Just a few years ago, one of our department professors was so stressed by students that he developed depression. Chapter 12. I went to Julia's classroom to find her. In the afternoon, I sent her a message. I refuse to believe she didn't get that. The Eastern European upheaval and the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991 meant the end of the Cold War. But all she replied with was a question mark. A question mark. I stared at it a thousand times, hoping she'd say something else, but nothing. When I opened the classroom door, I saw her, and, of course, standing right next to her was that junior, Victor, or whatever his name was. This time, I remembered his name. When he saw me walk in, Victor frowned and blocked my way. What are you doing here? Unrelated people shouldn't enter the classical literature reading room. Of course, I wasn't going to step aside. I'm here to find my girlfriend, Julia. Honestly, I didn't expect her to respond. The thing she ignored the most was me calling her name, but this time, Julia took off her protective gloves, walked over to me, and stood by my side. Let's go. Not only was I stunned, but even Victor was wide-eyed in surprise. Senior, 
What about the report? The day's over. If you want to work overtime, you can do it yourself. Maybe it was because she had grown up in such a comfortable environment. Julia treated everyone the same, calm, indifferent, and never warm. I followed her out of the lab, feeling a ripple in my heart, despite myself. Chapter 13. It's rare for Julia and me to spend an entire evening together. She's usually busy studying newly borrowed literature, and sometimes she'd come home to eat the dinner I'd cooked, sometimes not. But today was different, she actually took me grocery shopping with her. I already knew what she liked to eat. As I was picking out potatoes, I noticed the girl standing by the freezer, leaning against the shopping cart. She was watching me. Her beauty was the kind that strikes you immediately, leaving a lasting impression. Once you've had a taste, you can't forget it. The pale light behind her made her look even more serene as she quietly watched me, lost in thought. I had no idea what she was thinking. But after we got home, I figured out what was on her mind. The room was dark. I was about to put the groceries down and turn on the lights when she suddenly grabbed me by the neck and kissed me. And once again, we ended up on the hallway floor, just like before. Maybe we really should clean up the shoes in the hallway, but at least I managed to raise my hand to protect her head. Doing things like this was like a pastime for us, like any couple. When it came to showing love, I was probably far more intense than she was. She usually didn't respond much to my affection, but in moments like this, her responses were always more noticeable. Moonlight softly lit up her face. I realized she was looking down at me, but I couldn't read the emotions in her eyes. Nor did I understand how she saw me. I just felt that as long as I kept her tied to me, she'd be mine. As for the bitterness and embarrassment, that was something I had to deal with. I would absorb it all. If I hit a wall, I'd turn back. And if one day I couldn't bear it anymore, I'd leave. By the time we were done, I didn't have the energy to cook. So Julia ended up making dinner. It was rare for me to eat her cooking, honestly. It tasted pretty good. You should cook from now on. I nodded in approval. After her shower, she returned to her usual indifferent self, barely acknowledging me with a faint response. Chapter 14. That day, my professor specifically called me into her office. Elise Fu, the youngest professor of criminology at a university, had countless students vying to study under her. No one would think there'd be an idiot who would give up the chance to study abroad with her. I was that idiot. Joseph, if you have any requests. Just let me know. I'll do everything I can to accommodate you. All your evaluations are A+. So you should know I think very highly of you. My team is leaving for the UK soon. And we can still handle the paperwork. This is your last chance. The woman, dressed in a smoky blue chipao, leaned against her desk. After a while, she frowned. I heard from Daniela that you're hesitating because of relationship issues. Daniela really talks about everything. But it was clear that this expert on studying murderers wasn't exactly adept at understanding why young couples argue. Just as I was about to explain, someone barged into the office. How many times have I told you not to be so reckless? Elise frowned as she looked at the out-of-breath Daniela, who had just stumbled in. Professor. Joseph. Look at this post. It's already gone viral, spreading all over the school. There was a confession wall at our university. Despite its name, students used it to air grievances, or even engage in arguments. In short, it was the perfect place for gossip, but I never thought I'd see my own name on it. I lost my pen in the Mingda building lab yesterday afternoon. That pen was a gift to my grandfather from a famous physicist, and my grandfather passed it down to me. Not only is it valuable, but it also holds great sentimental value. The security cameras in the Mingda building were down, but the entrance logs to the literature reading room show that during the time it went missing, only my senior and one other person, a psychology major named Joseph from the sociology department, were present. So, Joseph, if you see this, please return my pen. The post even had a picture of me from my student ID. The confession wall was seen by thousands of students every day. And a story like this, naming names, spread quickly across all the grades. Ah, I know Joseph. He's from our department. Really? What's he like? He's smart and capable. Kind of good looking. I didn't expect him to be like this. Yeah. Why would a top student resort to something so sneaky? No way. Isn't this guy a total clown? I heard he got together with that campus beauty from the literature department. Probably from simping. Hey, we can't judge based on one person's side of the story, right? Talking behind someone's back isn't cool, blame him. If he didn't do this, there wouldn't be rumors. For a moment, I felt so angry that blood rushed to my head. What kind of nonsense was this pen? I'd never even seen it. The post wasn't anonymous, it was from Victor, Julius Jr. I didn't know if he genuinely thought I'd stolen it or if he just wanted to throw dirt on me. The next second, my advisor called, Joseph, come to the office right away. I took a deep breath, slowly exhaled, all right, professor, but before that, there's something else I need to do, I hung up the phone, raised my hand, and called the police, chapter 15, Victor, 
Regarding your stolen pen, I've already contacted the police, and this officer will assist you in locating it. Now, I'd like us to discuss why you posted my personal information and photo on social media without my consent. If you don't provide a reasonable explanation, I'll have to ask the officer to take you in as well. The tension in the advisor's office was palpable. Victor leaned against the desk, giving me a nasty smile. You steal someone's stuff and still have the audacity to act shamelessly. You think I don't have solid evidence. I kept telling myself to stay calm. Stay calm. Losing control would only make things worse for me. But when I saw the girl standing next to him, my heart couldn't help but take a heavy blow. Julia always knew how to get under my skin, no matter the situation. I went with senior Julia to check the records. The only person who entered during that time was you. If you didn't take the pen, then who did? I couldn't even hear the rest of what she said. All that stuck with me was that one sentence. I went with senior Julia to check the records. So, she had been with him the entire time. Did she also think I took the pen? I stared at Julia standing behind the crowd. She always carried herself with that detached, above it all demeanor. As if no one could ever pull her down from her pedestal. She looked at everything, me included, with a lofty, distant gaze. The police took over the investigation, and the post on the confession wall was removed. On the way back, Julia walked ahead with her hands in her pockets. I couldn't help myself and caught up with her. What are you thinking? She stopped in her tracks and frowned at me. What do you mean? Do you also think I took his pen? She looked up at me, her gaze unreadable. After a moment, she turned and kept walking. It has nothing to do with me. The professor assigned a task, and he's been distracted. I just want him to finish what he's supposed to do. I hurried to catch up, grabbing her wrist. My voice trembled, betraying my emotions. Can't you stand by me just once, Julia? Believe in me, even if it's just this one time. Again, I was begging. I always craved her approval, always hoping that this time, she'd finally be moved, even if just a little, but she never was. If you have a clear conscience, there's nothing to be afraid of. Why should I believe you? Does my belief really matter that much to you? She frowned again, a sure sign of her growing impatience. I bit my tongue. What a fool you are, Joseph. I let go of her hand. Yes, it does. I wasn't sure if she heard me as she walked away. Chapter 16. The ending of this whole situation was dramatic. In the end, the police found the pen wedged in the gap of a desk in the literature reading room. I thought this would clear my name, and at the very least, I'd get an apology from him. But after he was brought to the police station for a warning, the next time I saw him, he just sneered at me. Who knows if you didn't sneak in last night and put the pen back yourself? That one comment. As soon as the police left, I fought him. We both ended up in the school hospital. Impulsiveness is dangerous. But I wasn't about to be a pushover either. Daniela said I handled it poorly. That I should have recorded everything and filed a complaint for harassment. But now that we'd fought, it wasn't just his fault anymore. At least I got in a good punch. Knocked his tooth loose. Even though I ended up with a cut on my face. But at least he winced in pain. Later, it was Julia who came to the hospital to pick me up. I don't know why. But the moment I saw her, my heart started aching. I just liked her. And seeing her made my heart soften. What could I do? I threw my arms around her. She froze for a second and then asked. What are you doing? Her tone was cold. She didn't understand. And she didn't need to. I was used to it. I ruffled her hair. Trying to take her hand. And said. Let's go. She looked at me. I'm not here for you. Huh? My cheek still stung from the fight. Then I saw her stand up and walk over to the guy sitting ten seats away from me. The guy who had made me scrape my face in the fight. When you're ready. Come with me. We still have an experiment to finish. And the professor said the deadline is approaching. I didn't bother to look at his expression. I figured it would have a hint of smugness. Maybe a bit of gloating. All I felt was a dull, throbbing pain in my chest. Like being stung by a wasp. The wound on my face hurt too. I pressed my hand against my chest and told myself. Just a little more pain. And soon. It won't hurt anymore. Chapter 17. Julia arrived home around 9pm. Did you finish the experiment before the deadline? I sat on the couch. Looking up at her. She responded with a faint, mm, as she changed her shoes in the entryway and walked in. She stopped briefly as she passed by me. You guys fought today. Does your wound still hurt? Her tone was casual. Indifferent. I shook my head and continued speaking. Are you hungry? Want me to make you some late night food? She declined and went straight into the bedroom. I nodded to myself. It really did feel like just another ordinary night. I looked down at my phone, staring at the last message from my professor. Joseph. I'm glad you finally decided to join us for the study trip to the UK. We're short on time. The tickets are booked. Pack your bags tonight. We leave tomorrow morning. Chapter 18. Back in high school, Julia and I watched a movie together. It was called The Legend of 1900. There was a line in the movie I didn't quite understand back then. 
It described a painting hanging on a wall that one day just fell down without any warning. The pianist who had spent his life on a ship, one day, also wanted to leave without warning. At the time, I wondered how a person could make such a decision with no warning at all, until that morning at 6 a.m., when I packed my bags, left the keys at the door, and walked away from Julia without any warning. On my way past the artificial lake at school, I pulled off the necklace she'd given me that day and threw it into the water. Then, I sent her a message. Our couple's necklace fell into the lake. The fortune teller said that's a bad omen. So, Julia, let's break up. Chapter 19. German winters are freezing. I stood by the window, watching the snow slowly settle into the pine trees. Daniela came up beside me and handed me a cup of coffee. How's it going? I asked her. It's not looking good. She took a small sip of her coffee, looking down. This is an international academic conference. Everyone here is a renowned ancient text scholar, and now we've got a murder on our hands. And the method was so gruesome. No wonder they called us in. This was my fifth year away from a university. Following Elise, being under the guidance of a top expert, I'd learned a lot. But the cases we dealt with were also extremely difficult. I'd gone from rushing out of a crime scene to throw up in a trash can, to calmly sitting next to a corpse, sharing a steamed bun with Daniela. During investigations, profiling criminals, studying their psychology, and assessing their likelihood of reoffending all played a crucial role. That's why top universities were often called in to assist with major international cases. This time, we were investigating a murder that had taken place at an academic conference. It was a particularly challenging case. The suspect had brutally beheaded the victim and placed the head on a dinner plate. Revenge or a potential serial killer wasn't ruled out. Everyone at the conference was a suspect, so the police had secured the scene. You too, stop chatting outside, Joseph. Your foreign language skills are good. Go talk to the scientists at the crime scene again. Daniela, come with me. Elise pushed open the door, and even her usually calm and stunning face showed signs of frustration. It was clear this case was truly difficult. Got it. Sis, coming right away. Daniela quickly stood up and followed behind her. I took a final sip of my coffee and watched the two of them walk ahead. Daniela no longer hesitated to call Elise, sis, in front of me. They seemed to be stepsisters, and whether or not there was more to their relationship. I found myself wondering. Chapter 20. I tapped my pen against my forehead. I had only recently started learning German, so I could manage basic conversations. But when I had to talk to people who spoke no English, relying solely on my patchy German, it was a struggle. I furrowed my brow, looking at the slightly dazed German men in front of me. So, you were eating chocolate potatoes that afternoon. He said he saw the head on his plate and threw up all night. Suddenly, a soft voice cut in. It's rare to hear Mandarin in a foreign country. But what made me freeze wasn't just the familiarity of the language. It was the voice. Today was unbelievable, I just heard someone who sounded exactly like my ex-girlfriend. I looked up, and the moment I met her gaze, I froze completely. I never thought I'd run into Julia again. Seriously, I'd crossed the Atlantic. The world is so big. Surely, I could run for a lifetime and never see her again. Yet here she was, standing right in front of me, still in that white dress, tall and striking. Her face was as stunning as ever, and her expression was still infuriatingly indifferent. My eyes fell on the name tag hanging from her neck. Oh, so she's here as an invited ancient text scholar. I don't even know why I turned and ran the next second. I must have looked like a criminal on the run, but I didn't want to see her. From the moment I left her five years ago, I didn't want to see her again. Couldn't she just let me be? But clearly, the woman who chased after me, calling my name, wasn't planning to let me go that easily. In the end, she cornered me in the narrow space of the tea room. My hand scraped against the iron railing as I moved, turning red. I hissed in pain, and she immediately grabbed my hand. Are you okay? I pulled it away. Five years. This was the first time I'd seen her in five years. She hadn't changed. But when I shook off her hand, her eyes turned red. Chapter 21. I've been looking for you all these years. I heard her say. The steam from the coffee cup drifted between us as we sat on opposite sides of the stairs, with enough space for someone to sit between us. I. I asked the professors. Our classmates. Even went to the UK. But I couldn't find you anywhere. Why were you looking for me? I interrupted her. She turned her face towards me, her gaze intense and fixated, like she was trying to solve a difficult problem that had been tormenting her for a long time. Why did you break up with me? I had already thought through this question clearly five years ago. People's hearts are soft, and emotions are intricately intertwined. To say that I didn't think about her after leaving would be a lie. There were even moments, back across the Atlantic, when I pulled out my phone, almost pulling her out of the blacklist. But time is a cruel thing. It slowly wears away even the most intense emotions. In five years, with all the running around, I almost forgot the reasons I held on so tightly in the first place. Looking back now, all I feel is indifference, 
like watching a distant fire burn from the other side of the river. I rubbed the rim of my cup and found only one answer. That day, I was just completely exhausted. I stood up to leave, but she grabbed my wrist from behind. Joseph, we. I turned to look at her. Can we not end things? We can't. Even I didn't expect myself to answer so quickly. My breath came out in a white mist from the cold, and I realized it was the first time I'd ever seen her eyes redden this much. Chapter 22 Julia doesn't understand words. She kept following me. You're not used to this sauerkraut-flavored drink. When she saw me pick up a bottle with a green label, she warned me, but I've always been rebellious, and with Julia's words, I'm doubly so. I twisted off the cap, took a sip, and immediately started looking for a place to spit it out. She laughed beside me, her eyes turning into crescent moons, laughed. In the three years we were together, I barely saw her laugh. Since I couldn't shake her off, I gave up and let her follow. When she walked behind me, she would instinctively help translate German for me. She had a knack for communicating and seemed to know many of the researchers on site. I hadn't heard much about her in recent years, but it was clear she'd made a name for herself in the field of classical literature. After spending the day gathering information, I finally managed to piece together some of the details surrounding the events before and after the crime. It was now midnight, and we still hadn't identified the suspect. We were facing two major issues. First, with so many prestigious scholars gathered here, the costs were high. But now, with a murder, should the conference continue? Second, was the suspect likely to kill again? According to Elise, they were. The murder was clearly a case of revenge, and after killing the victim, the suspect had written in the victim's blood, in German, you can't escape, who couldn't escape, and what would the killer's next move be? We spent the entire night untangling the victim's relationships, pulling all-nighters like this was common, but the time difference was catching up to me, and I could barely stay awake, I rubbed my eyes and leaned back in my chair, hoping to catch a quick nap. When I opened my eyes again, I found myself resting on someone's lap. The fabric under my cheek was linen, soft against my skin. There was a faint scent of oranges, cool, with a hint of sweetness. It reminded me of a certain someone's favorite body wash. As soon as the thought crossed my mind, I bolted upright. Julia. I called her name coldly. She calmly adjusted the black-rimmed glasses I hadn't noticed she was wearing and tapped a pen against the notebook she had taken from me without my realizing it. There were some grammatical issues here. I think this is what it meant originally. The sections she had corrected made a lot more sense now. How strange. Five years ago, we had parted ways so abruptly. And now, here we were, casually chatting. Back then, I would never have dared hope for her help with my notes. Julia. I got up, intending to step outside for some fresh air. She stood up too, following behind me. Suddenly, a black coat was draped over my shoulders. The temperature difference between indoors and outdoors is big. Don't catch a cold. I sighed, rubbing my face, and turned to look at her. Do you want to talk, Julia? Chapter 23 The snow had stopped, but it seemed even colder outside. I stared at her thin shirt, yet I no longer felt the same concern for her, worrying that she might freeze. Whether she froze to death in this cold had nothing to do with me. The Zygarnik effect. People often can't forget things that were interrupted or left unfinished. Breaking up with me is the same. Julia, you're just unwilling to accept it. You're bothered because I was the one who ended things. You're struggling to cope with a relationship that was abruptly cut off but that's a normal psychological phenomenon, and I'm explaining it to you now. You don't love me or like me. It's just that your unwillingness to accept it is at play here. You lost that caretaker who was always looking after you, and now you feel like you can't adjust. That's all, but you don't need to be upset. So many years have passed, and there are plenty of people out there who are better for you than I ever was. Plenty of people who like you, right? So, do you understand now? We're over. Completely. Don't look for me again. Don't follow me anymore. Okay. I. No. Suddenly. She hugged me. She was cold, just as I had expected. The melted snow had soaked into her sleeves. I couldn't see her face, but I could feel her trembling. No, I don't dislike you. I don't not love you. All these years, I've thought about it over and over again. It's not that I can't accept it. It's just that. She stopped, and after a long pause, her voice faded into the wind and snow. But in that instant, I could hear her breathing, shallow, choked. It was as if she had prepared for this moment for a long time. Or maybe it had just ambushed her. I'm sorry. I pushed her but she wouldn't let go. That's enough. You've apologized. Julia, if you keep pestering me, I'll call the police. Chapter 24. I always thought I was shameless, but I never expected that one day, I'd think Julia was the shameless one. In the breakfast room, I looked up at the woman sitting across from me. Do you not understand what I'm saying? She coughed a few times, half her face hidden in her jacket. Her eyes were dark, with bags under them from sleepless nights. I can be your translator. It was a tempting offer, objectively reasonable. Yesterday. Thanks to her help, 
My efficiency had indeed improved. I couldn't find any drawbacks. I took her with me as I questioned the attendees again. The police had already interrogated these people countless times. But because I had Julia with me, they were more patient. During the investigation, she kept coughing beside me. It wasn't surprising. Considering the heavy snow yesterday, she had been wearing the thin shirt and had even given me her coat. Of course she'd catch a cold. But now, I had no right to care about her. I was no longer the Joseph who would rush out in the middle of the night to buy her cold medicine in the rain when she had a fever. At most, I could remind her to drink more hot water. We've questioned the relevant people inside and out, over and over. Everyone connected to the victim has been isolated. At the bar, Daniela was rubbing her head, which was already a mess from all the thinking. If it was a revenge killing, then we should be in the clear, right? Then she looked up and saw Julia standing next to me. Well, if it isn't the renowned classical literature scholar, Julia. Honestly, I should thank you. If it weren't for you breaking his heart four years ago, Joseph might not have come. You can glare at me all you want. I bet you're already plotting how to kill me. Huh? Well, let me remind you. We live in a society with laws now. I ignored her rambling. Something about this case felt off. But then again, none of the cases we handled were ever straightforward. You can't escape. From the suspect's message, it seemed like a revenge killing. Everyone connected to the victim was under protection now. Logically, I shouldn't feel this uneasy. Unless, my train of thought was interrupted when Elise came striding over. I had never seen her this rattled before. Evacuate now. What? Daniela looked just as shocked. And then, the ground shook with a loud explosion. Unless, everyone here was connected to the victim. The suspect wasn't just after one person. They wanted to take down the entire classical literature community. Chapter 25. Eight C4 bombs were planted in four different locations throughout this building. There's no way to evacuate so many people quickly. When I realized this, I quietly arranged for a group of core scholars to be relocated in advance. As we descended the escape route, Elise explained briefly while walking down the stairs. Then she suddenly turned around and saw Julia. What are you doing here? It seemed Julia was supposed to be on the core scholars list. Elise continued. The attackers are members of an extremist religious group. They claim that the Babylonian stone tablet you decoded last week contains information that will destroy the world. I suspect there's a mole. Both the placement of the bombs and their quick discovery of our evacuation suggest inside help. The first bomb has already exploded. Before she could finish speaking, the stairwell we were in began to shake. A massive crack appeared between us and Daniela and Elise, who were ahead of us. Daniela grabbed onto a sturdy metal beam and held onto Elise. Elise reached out her hand to me. In situations like this, it was almost second nature for the three of us to work together. After all, we had been in and out of emergency rooms countless times over the years. I reached out to grab her hand, and just as our fingers were about to touch, the ground beneath my feet gave way. My heart nearly jumped into my throat, but the next second, I was caught by someone's firm grip. Julia's hand was trembling. After all, she was a scholar who spent her days poring over ancient texts. How could she possibly have the strength to pull someone up in an instant? But she held on with all her might. Rocks tumbled down, and drops of sweat from her forehead landed on the back of my hand. Boiling hot. Let go. I don't know why. In such an emergency, my mind was so clear. I stared at her, enunciating every word. Let go. I don't want to owe you my life, Julia. Chapter 26. Whether or not I owed her my life was irrelevant for now. Because the next second, the ground where she was standing also collapsed. We both plummeted downward as Daniela's scream echoed in the air. I felt something hard hit my head on the way down. Then I felt Julia shift, pulling me into her arms to shield me. Then came the sharp pain, the impact, and Julia's muffled groan near my ear. When I regained consciousness, I was in complete darkness. I could hear Julia's sharp breaths which meant she was still alive, but it didn't sound good. I reached down, feeling sticky liquid beneath me. She was slumped beside me. First aid knowledge is essential for us, so I ripped off part of my shirt in the dark and tried to locate her wound. When I pressed down on a certain area, she groaned but kept holding it in. Julia, it helps to scream when you're in pain. It can relieve some of the tension, but she didn't respond. Her choked, shallow gasps told me exactly how much it hurt. I let her be. I began to treat her wound as best I could, but it was too dark and there were stones everywhere, the blood wouldn't stop, it just kept flowing out, just when I thought she might pass out from the pain, her hand found mine, her fingers searching before she laced them through mine, interlocking, her blood slicked hand was slippery, and when I tried to pull away, I couldn't, the day you left, I thought you'd come back, amidst the dust and debris, her voice sounded faint, fragile, as if I barely recognized it, so I waited, I waited, but you never came, they told me you were gone, that you went to the UK, I thought, how many hours does it take to fly from the UK? How are you going to come back to see me? I didn't know you never planned to come back. 
I realized that when you blocked me, deleted all my contacts, and I couldn't reach you, even after changing my number a dozen times, that year, I don't even know how I got through it. Every time a strange number called, I thought it was you. I scrolled through our chat history, wondering why I hadn't replied to your messages more. I couldn't figure it out. I applied to go to the UK, but I couldn't find you. No information about you at all. The world is so big. How could I find you so easily before? Then I realized, it was because you wanted me to find you. I. I know leaving you alone is for the best. You didn't want me anymore, but now you're right in front of me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. By the end, all I heard were constant apologies, over and over again. I heard sounds outside. It seemed the rescue team was calling out for survivors. I immediately yelled for help. Dim beams of light pierced the darkness. Something felt wrong. I looked into her eyes. Her gaze was unfocused. Blood red consuming her vision. Chapter 27. Julia was blind. She also had two or three broken ribs. A steel beam had nearly pierced the back of her skull, just two or three inches away from fatal damage. The doctor said the blindness was temporary, but how long it would take to recover, and whether her vision would fully return, depended on her efforts. For now, though, she couldn't see anything at all. I stood by her hospital bed, outside. The sky had darkened, and the fading sunset cast a thin, cruel red light over her. After some hesitation, I finally spoke. Julia, I'm really grateful to you. If it weren't for you, I'd probably have lost an arm or a leg, but you know, there's something called moral coercion. You saving me doesn't mean I'm going to start over with you. I won't. I can pay for your medical bills. Hire a caretaker. If you want me to take care of you, I'll do my best. But once you're better, once you're out of the hospital, we're done. Do you understand? For a long time, she didn't respond. I sighed. Think it over. I'll leave for now. Then I saw her suddenly raise her hand, grasping at the air as if reaching for something that wasn't there. Don't go. Stay with me. I'm begging you. Chapter 28. I wasn't sure if the word obedient was appropriate to describe Julia now. She ate whatever food was given to her and was willing to cooperate with all her treatments. I heard that the medication for her eyes was quite painful, but she never made a sound. The nurse said it wasn't normal, that she only held back when I was there. Julia's only request was that I stay by her side. After all, she lost her vision because of me, so she wanted me to stay. She didn't ask for much, just my presence, and I couldn't refuse her this. I didn't want to owe her anything more. Once she fell asleep, I decided to step out for a moment and went to the hallway to wash an apple. On my way out, I ran into her primary doctor. Are you Julia's partner? Thanks to Julia, my German had improved over these past few days. Enough to communicate with them now. No. I shook my head. Please avoid arguing with the patient again. Her emotional instability is causing tears, which are not good for the healing of her wounds. Tears? I froze for a second. We're not in a relationship. She saved me. If my presence is affecting her recovery. I'll leave. That's all I could offer in this situation. When I returned to the room, Julia was sitting up in bed. Her eyes were still covered with bandages, but it looked like she was awake. She had probably heard everything, so I didn't bother pretending. You heard what the doctor said, didn't you? If you keep this up, I won't be able to stay with you anymore. I want your eyes to heal soon, so we can put an end to this. After a long pause, she whimpered softly and shook her head. In a voice so fragile it seemed like it could break with the wind, she said, I won't cry don't go. I stood there, watching her. She looked like a little rabbit that had been cruelly abandoned, and because of her owner's command, she wasn't allowed to cry. Chapter 29. I decided not to stay with Julia for now. Elise and the team were short on staff, so it was a good time for me to step away. When I arrived at Elise's office, a vase narrowly missed my foot as it crashed to the floor, shattered. I shrugged. This wasn't the first time I had seen this kind of scene. Every now and then, those two needed a blowout like this. I'm your sister. Elisa's voice came through the door, barely keeping her anger in check. So what? Wasn't a sister born to serve her younger sibling? Then there was a thud. It seemed the vase had hit its mark this time. Daniela emerged from the office, clutching her head, with a streak of blood running down one side of her face. I hesitated, not daring to enter, but Daniela, despite holding her forehead, still had the energy to grin. Hey, Joseph, don't go in now. My sister's furious, considering the blood on her head. I could tell. She sat beside me, casually tending to her wound. How's it going with Julia? The way she looked at me that day. I swear she wanted me dead. With the way things are between us, you can't just let her off the hook that easily. I sighed. Julia had always been a thorn in my side, whether four years ago or now. A knot I couldn't untangle. I don't know. I'd rather keep my distance. If I can. I tilted my head back, lost in thought, until my phone buzzed in my pocket. A message that demanded my attention. I answered. It was the hospital. Mr. Joseph, 
Could you come back, please? The patient is very upset without you. Please help calm her down. Chapter 30. So when I saw Julia again, her collar was disheveled. The four needle had come loose. Her eyes were blind. And she was being guided by someone while calling out my name. Joseph. Where's Joseph? I want to see Joseph. Joseph. What are you shouting about? I stood there and spoke to her. And she abruptly stopped. She raised her hand to straighten her collar. Then her hair. How does this girl still care about her appearance? I'm here. I stood still. Watching her stumble toward me. She finally reached me and burrowed into my arms. Her body now smelled of disinfectant and faintly of blood. Julia. Do you really think this is how you're going to get me to forgive you? I stood there. Stiff as a board. Four years. I told myself that I just needed to feel the pain once. To yell at her once. But it still hurt. Like someone was squeezing my heart. My whole body aching. Isn't it too late to turn back now? In the silence of the night. I asked her. But she just kept trembling. Clinging to me. Shaking. I couldn't tell if it was blood or something else seeping through the bandages. Dripping down. I thought to myself. All of the doctor's instructions were in vain. Chapter 31. That night felt like a storm had hit. Afterward. Julia seemed to pull herself together. I couldn't quite describe the change. It was subtle. Like the storm clouds around her had begun to clear. Letting in a bit of light. It was good news because the doctor said her recovery had sped up. The faster she recovered. The sooner I could leave. I did everything I could to help her get better. I never imagined I'd learn a skill like feeding a blind person. Most of the time. We were silent. She wasn't one for talking. And I didn't enjoy talking to her. The day her bandages were removed from her eyes was also the day I left. She told the doctor she could see again. The doctor said that was great. I stood by her bedside and said. My visa's about to expire. I need to go. She sat there for a long time. Stunned. Then. In a soft voice. She asked me. When are you leaving? This afternoon. Please don't leave without saying goodbye again. I'm telling you now. Aren't I? Another silence fell. I watched her hands. She was gripping the bedsheet tightly. Then releasing it. Over and over again. Then she smiled and asked. Will I ever see you again? Are we in a relationship where we need to see each other? I cut her off. Honestly. This kind of phrasing was something Julia often used on me. Joseph. Do you really need me to stay with you? Joseph. Can't you even handle something this simple? Joseph. Does this really need to be made into such a big deal? Now. I could say it back to her without hesitation. I didn't know whether I should thank Julia for that. She listened to me. Then fell into a daze. She'd been spacing out a lot these past few days. What was going through her head was something I'd never understand. I turned to leave. And she called out to me from behind. Can you leave me a way to contact you? I didn't answer and closed the door behind me. I remembered the time when I sent her friend requests on WeChat. Over ten of them. She probably never imagined that one day she'd want to add back the boy she had rejected more than ten times. Chapter 32. I flew back to the UK alone. It was a small plane. And the flight was bumpy. I rested my chin on my hand. Staring at the drifting clouds outside. It felt like the past month had been a chaotic dream. Seeing Julia again, it was impossible for my heart not to react. After all, she was someone I had once loved deeply in my youth. It felt like ripping open a wound that had finally started to heal. Anger. Loneliness. Sadness. They brewed like storm clouds. But unlike before, I couldn't cry as easily. I just endured it. Letting it pass. I told myself that with her in Germany and me in the UK. A thousand kilometers apart. There would never be a second meeting in this lifetime. But three months after I returned to the UK. A new neighbor moved in. Her name was Julia. Chapter 33. Quite a coincidence. Isn't it? Your university invited me to give a lecture. I didn't expect the apartment I rented to be so close to yours. A bouquet of bluebells was held out in front of me. Fresh flowers. I took them and tossed them straight into the trash can on my left. I walked past her. Got into my car. And drove to work. For the next few days. That's how it was between us. When I left for work, I saw her. When I came home, I saw her. Whether I left at 5, 7, or 9 a.m., whether it was raining or windy, I always saw the same woman, dressed in elegant skirts, looking beautiful. Sometimes she brought flowers, sometimes food, and every single time, I threw it in the trash. It was like a contest of wills between us, until one day, I couldn't take it anymore. I was worried someone would report me for extreme waste. Julia, haven't you had enough? I stood at my front door, hands in my pockets, staring at her. She held up a bag of dumplings. I tried these. The flavor is authentic. You've been working on case files all day without eating. Remember to have a meal. I took a deep breath. 700 meters down this street, there's a whole row of restaurants. If I'm hungry, I'll go out and eat. Got it. She stood there, frozen, holding the bag of dumplings, not knowing whether to raise or lower her hand. 
I knew the place she got those dumplings from. It was a well-known shop, pretty far from here, and you had to wait at least an hour in line. But so what? Even if you care for me, even if you look after me, I don't want to go back to what we were. I unlocked the door and slammed it shut behind me. And by the way, you're really annoying right now. I had been planning to ask the landlord to find me another place to stay. But after that day, Julia stopped bothering me. Sometimes there would still be a bouquet of flowers at my door. When I coughed during lectures at school, there would be medicine left on the stairs outside. But I never saw her again. I guess she finally realized how much of a nuisance she had become. Chapter 34 Julia's field is completely different from mine. So we rarely see each other on campus. That's fine with me. It means I don't have to stress about avoiding her. Still, from time to time, I hear her name in passing conversations with classmates. It's normal. Julia grew up being noticed. Geniuses naturally attract attention, especially those who are almost perfect in every aspect. Even their slight flaws in personality become what people call the allure of the unattainable. This year, Elise unexpectedly took on a new student. She's never been interested in amassing a large number of disciples. And in recent years, very few have caught her eye. Just when I wondered if another prodigy had emerged out of nowhere, she took a small sip from her teacup and said, they've got connections. Someone pulled strings. You take care of them. In other words, this mess is now yours. Don't come to me with it. Honestly, this mess wasn't unwelcome. If I wanted to get promoted to associate professor, I needed this last push. But when I saw who my new mentee was, I felt awful. Victor. First Julia. Now Victor. It seemed like all the bad karma from the past had come back to haunt me making me wonder if this was my unlucky year. Chapter 35. Switching from classical literature to psychology. It's hard not to think that maybe he just couldn't keep up with classical literature. I didn't expect that Victor would now be a minor internet celebrity back in our country. He gained a following thanks to his good looks and his background in the literature department at a university. He created an image for himself as someone inspirational, intelligent, well-educated, and willing to share his daily life with his followers. In his videos, he's confident, cheerful, and approachable. After completing his psychology courses at a university, he decided to switch fields and continue his studies in psychology in the UK. I heard that he shares his daily life, with hundreds of thousands of people watching every day. I even accidentally appeared in one of his videos, becoming his evil senior. Here's what happened, honestly. His English wasn't even good enough to pass IELTS with a 6. 5. His papers were full of grammatical errors. Elise said, no, and I simply passed on her rejection to him. The next evening, he posted a video on social media. In the video, his eyes were red, as if he had been crying. He took a deep breath, then spoke in a stubborn but deliberately restrained tone. It's currently 1.30 in the morning here in London. I've been thinking for a long time, but I just can't sleep. Everyone talks about how glamorous studying abroad is, but it's not like that at all. Maybe I'm just unlucky. You see, the same senior who gave me a hard time during my undergraduate years is here again. People already know this senior has a questionable character. My grandfather was a famous physicist, and his friend gave him a pen, which he passed down to me. Maybe my senior was envious of that pen because, one day, when he came to the lab, he secretly took it. Later, the situation escalated. The police got involved. My senior snuck back into the lab at night and quietly returned the pen, and then he turned it around, accusing me of framing him. Why would I frame him? What do I gain from that? I just wanted my pen back, but he, being so clever, set me up. This whole incident affected me greatly. I fell into depression for a while and only started recovering recently. Posting vlogs and receiving all your encouragement helped me heal. But now I've run into him again. And I feel devastated. I don't know what to do. A few days ago, he blocked my thesis, refused to let me submit it, and won't allow me to communicate with the professor. I don't know if it's because he's been abroad too long, but he's changed. There's an air of arrogance in everything he says and does. I don't think even he expected the video to blow up the way it did but it exploded in a way no one could have predicted. International studies, isolation, bullying, combined these themes, and suddenly it became viral. The first day, I was still complaining to Elise that Victor wasn't a good fit as my student. The next day, my inbox was flooded with hateful comments. I had been doxxed. Insults like idiot and scumbag were common at first glance. Of course, there were even more vulgar and offensive words. Things I couldn't even repeat out loud. My phone was bombarded until it crashed and my address was leaked. The comment sections on social media were filled with abuse. Some people even took their anger to the official accounts of our university. With millions of followers and a controversial subject, this video sparked widespread discussion and criticism of me. In the age of the internet, it's all too easy to ruin someone's life. All it takes is a few keystrokes. This kind of person doesn't deserve to live. I hope he dies on the streets of the UK.
I'm heading to his university now to start a protest, and you'll get applause. Everyone sees themselves as the righteous one, holding a sword of justice, determined to punish the evil in their minds. And so, students at our university who had seen the video started targeting me. After work one day, I found my car with slash tires, I knelt in front of it, running my fingers over the spot where broken glass had punctured the rubber. Daniela came up beside me, I'll drive you home. I nodded. Don't check your phone or anything. This is just ridiculous. Don't these people have any critical thinking skills? Can't they judge for themselves? As we drove, I rested my chin on my hand, watching the streetlights blur past the car window. When we got to my building, I saw someone I hadn't seen in a long time, Julia. When she saw me get out of the car, she rushed over, hesitating, as if wanting to reach out and hold my hand. But she stopped abruptly. She just stood there and watched as I went inside. After my shower that night, I looked out from upstairs. The girl was still standing under the streetlight. The shadows of the trees danced in the breeze. But she stood there like a lone pine, swaying. I had no idea how much longer she planned to stay. Chapter 36 The next day, Julia got into an argument with one of her students. It started when the student couldn't answer a question during class. Julia asked the student what was going on and happened to glimpse an email the student was preparing to send to me, filled with vile and insulting words. Julia slapped the student across the face, which led to them both ending up at the campus hospital. It was late afternoon by the time I arrived. Julia wasn't physically hurt, but the doctor said her old injuries from Germany had flared up again. I sat beside her, looking up. I stared at the glaringly bright ceiling lights. I didn't look at her, but I asked softly, Julia, does the truth matter? It does. I heard her say, but this time, my answer was, it doesn't. It doesn't matter to Victor, it doesn't matter to the masses online, and it shouldn't matter to me. No one cares how much you've suffered unless you lay yourself bare. They are attacking a fictional person, one who just happens to have my name, and they want me to pay for what this fictional person has done. If I try to explain, I didn't do it, believe me. Who's going to listen? No one. They're just swiping through short videos, playing around on forums, leaving a comment to curse at you, and by the next minute, they've already forgotten you. Who cares if you're innocent? No one does. But you care so much it's killing you. And for what? I once worked on a case where a girl was cyberbullied for years to prove her innocence. She took her own life. What did she get in return? A year later, people still believed she did what they accused her of. That's the world we live in now, where the internet has evolved. Short videos dominate, and people can easily take someone's life with an invisible knife. But you know what's even crueler? The people who wield that knife never feel like they were holding it in the first place. I don't know why I said all that to her that day. Someone like me should have let it go long ago. But maybe it's because she's Julia. Ah, she's Julia. Her hand had in four drip connected. I stood up. So why should I care? Adler's psychology once said that life is about separating your own tasks from the tasks of others. But then I heard her say from where she sat. No, it does matter. It matters a lot. Suddenly. It felt like time had looped back. I was standing in that same moment from four years ago. I was holding onto her wrist, and she furrowed her brow and asked me, Why do you always want me to believe in you? Does my belief really matter that much? And now, this was her answer. Chapter 37 I never imagined that someone like Julia, who doesn't use social media, would post a long article online. In it, she meticulously detailed every aspect of the situation involving the pen back in college. She provided evidence showing that it was impossible for me to sneak back and return the pen. She wrote a lot. It turns out the reason that post on the confession wall was taken down so quickly back then was because she found the person in charge and asked them to delete it. Turns out, when the pen went missing, she told the instructor right away that she didn't think it was me who took it. These were things she never told me, though even if she had, I probably wouldn't have thought much of it. Throughout the article, she spoke solely from the perspective of a classmate. She never mentioned anything about our relationship. At the end of the post, she also provided her university affiliation and academic credentials, and personally vouched that I wasn't the kind of person Victor portrayed me as in his video. Honestly, very few people would risk their academic reputation to vouch for someone else, because even if I hadn't done anything wrong in the past, if I messed up later, she would be ruined along with me. After that, Elise also released a statement. She said that she would no longer serve as Victor's advisor and that his poorly written thesis was entirely his own fault and had nothing to do with me. What surprised me was that several professionals we had collaborated with over the years also came forward to vouch for me. Even the mother of the girl who had been driven to suicide by online harassment posted something under Victor's Weibo account. The internet's growth has made personal spaces public. Many people think they're still in a private space when they insult and criticize others, without realizing the blurring between private and public domains. In this digital age, everyone must be more responsible for their public statements. After that, 
The tide of public opinion shifted. The insults increased, but this time they were directed at Victor. The downfall of an influencer is a source of great entertainment. Content creators raced to capitalize on Victor's situation. All his past was dug up, and his videos were flooded with hateful comments. I suddenly felt a deep sadness, realizing that the words of that mother had no effect at all. Everyone was just reveling in their frenzy, seeking the next thrill. It didn't matter who they were celebrating over. Whose corpse was decaying, it was all irrelevant. Eventually, Victor recorded one last video. He jumped into the English channel. Some said he was rescued. Others said he wasn't. Chapter 38. Life went on as usual. I heard that Julia's visit was coming to an end, which was definitely something to celebrate. I was about ready to write, go back to Germany, on my face. But then, she walked up to me and told me, I've decided to stay at your university as a research scholar. I squinted at her, giving her a smile that wasn't exactly warm. Oh, really? Well, that's too bad. My advisor is being invited back to our home country, so I'll probably go with her. She froze for a moment, looking at me, unsure. It was the end of the year, and the streets were lit up with sparkling lights. I heard there was a fireworks show a little further down the street. When we reached my front door, I caught sight of the bright flowers blooming in the sky in the distance. Ever since I told her not to touch me, she hadn't done it again. She nodded and motioned with her chin for me to hold out my hand. A small necklace dangled in the air. It had a heart-shaped pendant, and it looked like there was supposed to be another one to match. It was the same necklace I had thrown into the university's artificial lake. Now hanging in front of me again, the colorful light reflected off her face as the distant sound of fireworks blended into the noise. Joseph, the necklace wasn't lost. Can we ignore what the fortune teller said? No. Happy New Year. Julia. She nodded again. Standing next to me. Exhaling. White mist drifted from her breath. Her voice catching slightly as the fireworks burst in the sky. But nothing could hide the faint red creeping into her eyes. 